Hey everybody. All right. So we've been talking about the atmospheres of the terrestrial planets, but let's get down to the planets themselves and see what things are like on the actual surface. Um, there's a connection. We started talking about this uh, before, but we'll get more into it today about the connection between the surface geology, what's going on with the rocks of the planet and the effect that it has on the atmosphere. Um, so you can sort of get a sense from a cartoon like this that uh, all four of the terrestrial planets, and we're also going to lump the moon in there. So the, the moon has a lot in common with the terrestrial planets, uh, which we'll see here in a minute. Um, but they all look different. They all look unique in their own ways. Let's try to figure out why that is. Um, it is a little peculiar that the planets are um, so different because they also have a lot in common, right? So before we get into how they're all different, let's go back and review what all the terrestrial planets have in common. What characterizes a terrestrial planet? Um, well, they're all small. They're all made of rock and metal. Uh, what about their densities? Well, if they're made of rock and metal, they're going to be dense. Um, they all have a secondary atmosphere, right? Not a big primary atmosphere like the Jovian planets have, but um, secondary atmospheres. Um, they all orbit close to the sun, and consequently they have higher surface temperatures. Shorter orbital periods, because they orbit close to the sun. Um, not very many moons, right? Few to no moons. Remember how the terrestrial planets all formed, right? The terrestrial planets formed out of the rock and dust in the protoplanetary disk. They all formed, all four of these terrestrial planets formed out of the same material, all at the same time, at the formation of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. So you would think, you would expect, that when the solar system was young, all four of these planets would have looked very similar. Right? They were all the same age, they all formed out of the same stuff. They should have been much more identical. And yet, four and a half billion years later, they've all evolved to be unique in their own way. Let's see if we can't figure out why that is. Uh, let's start on the Earth because it's easier to study. It's right underneath your feet. We know more about it. Um, if you look inside the Earth, the Earth has three major layers. Now, those of you that have taken a geology class are probably bristling at that. Um, you know, there are, there are lots and lots of layers inside the Earth when you, when you look at things in much more detail. But, you know, we're going to take the broad strokes here, right? The three major layers of the Earth are the core, which is mostly metallic, iron and nickel. You've got the mantle, the liquid, the liquid molten hot mantle. And then you've got the crust of the Earth, right? The solid, the solid surface that we're all walking around on. And... The the thing that the thing that it's really easy to lose track of, um, you know, living here, is the Earth's crust is really thin. We are walking around living on a thin shell of rock that is floating on this giant ocean of molten hot magma in the mantle. At its thickest point. At its thickest point, the crust of the Earth is about 60 kilometers thick, which sounds like a lot, except that the Earth's radius is 6,000 kilometers, which means at its thickest point, the crust of the Earth is 1% the radius of the Earth. The Earth really is, I mean, the, the crust of the Earth is like the skin of an apple, which is why I threw that little image in there, right? The crust of the earth is like the skin of an apple. It is this 1% thick skin 
just floating on top of the mantle and the core. The Earth is mostly mantle and core. And when I say floating, I mean floating, right? The crust of the Earth is just plates of solid rock that are floating on the hot, molten, magma mantle underneath us. Why is it floating? Why is the crust floating? Why does anything float? Because it's less dense. And so this, the mantle of the earth is this molten liquid magma, right? What, what is magma? Magma is lava, but it's underneath the earth. It's inside the earth, so it's still magma, right? We don't call it lava until it erupts onto the surface. Um, and so the earth's mantle is this giant ocean of liquid hot rock with, this, with these thin little plates of rock floating on the surface. And the earth is still hot on the inside. The, the mantle and the core are still hot, and that heat is keeping the mantle liquid. Why is the earth hot? Well, there's a lot of heat left over from the formation of the solar system. You know, when these planets formed, you took a whole bunch of rock and dust and smashed them into each other, and that generates a lot of heat. Also, you've got um, some metals in the core of the earth are radioactive. Things like uranium and thorium that are heavy metals, right? But they're radioactive. And so when they, as they slowly decay over billions and billions of years, um, that releases heat and that adds a little bit of extra heat to the inside of the earth. And so that heat is slowly radiating its way from the core up through the mantle. And as you get toward the top of the Earth's mantle, it that heat drives the mantle to convect. What does that mean? What is convection? Well, convection is the process where usually here on Earth, you know, here, here living on Earth's surface, we talk about how hot air rises and cold air sinks. Well, there's a reason for that. And that's because when you heat things up, they expand and become less dense. And when they're less dense, they float. So what's happening here is you've got the, the hot core of the Earth and the hot uh, inner mantle. Um, that heat is radiating its way from the inside of the Earth out toward the surface. And that heat hits a blob of magma down here. When that blob of magma gets heated up from underneath that, well, what's the magma made of? It's made of rock and metal. What happens to rock and metal when you heat it up? It expands. And when it expands, that blob of magma becomes less dense and it floats. And so this heated up magma, this heated up magma floats up toward the surface. When that hot magma hits the surface, it comes in contact with the, with the crust and it transfers that heat from the magma from the mantle to the crust in the in the process that in the process that magma cools off when it cools off it contracts it gets denser and then it sinks and when this magma sinks back down it gets replaced by another hot blob of magma bubbling up from underneath so that's what convection is convection is the transport of heat by by the flu by the flow of a fluid right this fluid the magma is flowing from in in flowing outward transporting that heat up toward the surface and then when when the magma cools off it sinks and gets replaced by another blob from underneath there are conveyor belts all inside the earth all inside the earth's mantle there are these conveyor belts of hot magma bubbling up hitting the crust cooling off and then sinking and then once those blobs sink back down here, they can be reheated again, and the loop keeps on flowing. This is slow, right? Because magma is viscous. It's thick. And when it flows, it flows very slowly. So it takes millions of years for a blob of magma to slowly bubble up to the surface, cool off, and then fall back down again. 
But that's one of the ways that heat gets transported from inside to outside. Um, when this happens, as this, as these uh, cells, as these convection cells, as these conveyor belts of magma flow up and down, in and out, um, there's friction, right? As this magma is crawling from right to left on this diagram, there's going to be friction. There's going to be rubbing between the, the, the flowing magma and the crust. And that friction drags the tectonic plates. The Earth's crust is broken up into a bunch of these plates. Right? The Earth's crust is not one solid shell. It's broken up into a bunch of thin but wide rocky plates. And as the magma inside the Earth flows, it drags the plates along with it. Look over here in the Atlantic Ocean. Right. All along the Atlantic Ocean, there's this what's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. There's this gap between the plates on the west side and the plates on the east side. There's, a, there's this gap, there's this seam that runs all the way down the length of the world. And here it is right here. Here's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And the magma is flowing westward on the west side, and it's flowing eastward on the east side. And so as this magma flows, it's pulling these tectonic plates. The western tectonic plates get pulled further west. The eastern tectonic plates get pulled further east. And so the North American plate and the Eurasian plate are being pulled apart. The South American plate and the African plate are being pulled apart. And then where they're being pulled apart, you create a little gap. There's a little crack at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, and that crack creates a little weak spot in the crust of the Earth, and so lava is allowed to erupt out. Lava flows from the mantle. Lava flows from the mantle uh, up out of that crack, and as soon as it hits the ocean water, it cools off and hardens into new, fresh rock. The youngest part of the Earth's surface is down there at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, because this is rock that just erupted out, just flowed out of the mantle onto the crust and became new, fresh, young crust. Meanwhile, over here on the other side, over here on the Pacific Ocean, this plate, you know, the, the North American plate is being carried, it's being pushed west, and it crashes into the Pacific plate. And so what you see here is what you see here is uh, that the North American plate is being carried west and crashing into the Pacific plate. And so the Pacific plate down here, the, the floor of the Pacific Ocean is being pushed down. The North American plate is riding up over the top of the Pacific plate. The Pacific plate is being pushed down underneath it. This is what's called subduction. Subduction is where a tectonic plate gets pushed back down into the mantle, and once it gets pushed back down into the mantle, all that rock is being reheated, remelted, it becomes magma, and it's being mixed back in to the mantle. So the Earth is constantly, but very slowly, resurfacing itself, right? Laying down new crust on one side of the planet and recycling old crust back into the planet on the other side of the planet. This is where you have lots of active geology, uh, volcanoes, right? You find a lot of volcanoes in, in the weak spots in between tectonic plates. There, that's, there's a reason why the entire Pacific Rim is lined with volcanoes and faults, right? Over here in California, you have the San Andreas Fault. You have all of these, all of these uh, islands of the Aleutians created over here by volcanoes erupting. You have all the volcanoes of uh, Japan and uh, uh, Guam and all this, right? The Marianas Trench, right? The deepest trench in the world is created because there's a gap between these two plates right over here. You also have mountain building, 
right? When the Pacific plate is being driven back down into the North American plate, this new mag this new magma is trying to bubble its way up through the crust and so you end up with when the north american plate rides up over the pacific plate it forces up the crust and then you have eruptions and upwelling of lava forcing itself onto the surface and you have the rocky mountains right this is why the Rocky Mountains go all the way from northern Canada all the way down into northern Mexico is because this whole length here is the Rocky Mountains because that's where the North American plate is crashing and subducting the Pacific plate, forcing up the whole Rocky Mountain range. This is also what drives continental drift, right? Because uh, 200 million years ago, North America, Europe, Africa and South America were all one big supercontinent. But then what are the continents? The continents are just the high part, the high points of the tectonic plates that are sticking up out of the ocean. So the, this rock, this rock here, this plate got driven west, this plate got driven west, these plates got driven east, and it pulled the supercontinent apart. And then where the, where the land got pulled apart, water rushed in and formed the Atlantic Ocean. And this is going to keep on going, right? The Earth is only the way it is right now. And the continental drift is going to keep on going. These parts of the world are going to move apart. Um, Africa and Europe are in the process of crashing into each other. India is in the process of crashing into Asia. Uh, Antarctica is migrating further north, and so it's going to keep on going. Why does all this happen? Why is the Earth still geologically active? Why is there still plate tectonics? Why is there still continental drift? Why are there still erupting volcanoes and active mountain building? All of it comes down to the fact that the mantle of the Earth is still convecting. And what drives the mantle to convect? Heat. As long as there's heat inside the Earth working its way up to the surface, that heat is going to drive convection, and that convection is going to drive active volcanoes, active mountain building, active plate tectonics, all of the active geology that you see here on Earth. This is the last step in the inorganic carbon cycle. We talked about this before, right, about how carbon cycles around the Earth uh, inorganically, again, just by chemical and geological reactions, not by life, right? You need, in order to complete the carbon cycle, you need rain and ocean water and rock, right? That carbon dioxide goes from the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide dissolves in the rain, dissolves, and that rainwater flows into the oceans, and then that carbon dioxide bonds with calcium minerals in the ocean to turn it into limestone and carbonate rocks, and those carbonate rocks accumulate on the ocean floor. But they don't stay that way, right? The ocean floor eventually gets subducted back into the mantle where that rock can be remelted and when that rock when those carbonate rocks remelt it unlocks the carbon dioxide so the carbon dioxide turns back into a gas it bubbles up out of a, out of, through the magma bubbles up out of a volcano it vents out of a volcano and back into the atmosphere again you have to have active geology you have to have plate tectonics that drive plates to subduct, you need to have erupting volcanoes to let the carbon dioxide back out to complete the cycle. If you break any one of these links in the chain, if you break any one of these steps in the cycle, then the carbon dioxide, or the carbon, I should say, the carbon gets stuck. That explains one of the ways why Venus, Earth, and Mars evolved differently, right? When Venus, Earth, and Mars were young, their atmospheres were mostly carbon dioxide. But in order to have the inorganic carbon cycle, in order to complete and, and, and uh, maintain the inorganic carbon cycle, you not just need carbon dioxide, you need water, you need subduction and plate tectonics. You need active volcanoes. Earth has all those. 
Venus and Mars don't anymore. When, when all three planets were young, they were probably much more identical. Venus, Earth, and Mars would have looked very similar. And yet this process of moving magma and gas and water around the planet, it works differently on Venus, Earth, and Mars. And that slight difference is what caused those three planets to evolve very differently over the last four billion years. Why does Earth have plate tectonics? Well, we think that, you know, in order for a planet to have plate tectonics, a planet needs to meet two criteria. The first thing is, in order to have plate tectonics, that planet needs to have a hot convecting mantle. You got to have that magma bubbling up and then sinking down. You got to have the magma moving around in order to push the crust around. That's criterion one. But a planet also needs to have a thin crust because you need a thin crust that is easy to break up into plates. You need it to be able to crack and move and slide and bend, right? In order to keep plate tectonics going, in order to maintain the flow of the tectonic plates, you need to have a plate. You, have, you need to be able to take those two plates and break them along those fault lines and you need to be able to take a tectonic plate and bend it to in order to in order to do subduction it needs to bend and flex and get re reburied and remelted inside the mantle earth's tectonic plates are really thin they're only i say tongue firmly in cheek they're only a few kilometers thick But not only that, not only are the Earth's tectonic plates made of rock, they're made of more flexible rock, right? The crust of the Earth is able to bend and flex. It's a little bit plastic. It is a little bit malleable. Why? What else is mixed in to the rock of the Earth that would make it bendable and flexible? Water. Liquid water. When the Earth makes new rock, when the Earth makes new tectonic plates, some of that liquid water from the oceans, the rain, the lakes, all that, some water gets mixed into the rock, and that makes the, makes the rock a little flexible so that it can be bent and cracked and pulled around by the, by the flowing magma and also bent back down into the magma and subducted. Of all the terrestrial planets, only Earth and Venus meet Criterion 1. Earth and Venus are still hot and convecting. How do you know? Because they have active volcanoes. Earth and Venus still have active volcanism, which means, well, if there's active volcanism, then the, 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 the inside of the planet must still be hot and liquid and, and convecting and erupting out of those volcanoes. Mercury and Mars don't have hot, a hot convecting inside anymore. But of Venus and Earth, only Earth has a thin, flexible crust. Only Earth meets Criterion 2. Venus doesn't have a nice, thin, flexible crust. The crust of Venus is thick and hard and brittle. So Venus, Venus's crust isn't nicely broken up into tectonic plates that can slide around. So this is the reason why only, of all the terrestrial planets, only Earth has plate tectonics, because only Earth meets both criteria. Another consequence of active geology is that the Earth generates a magnetic field. All right, so how does a planet generate a magnetic field? Not just the Earth, but any planet. How does any planet generate a magnetic field? Um, well, it's a little complicated, but the best theory that we have today to explain the magnetic fields of planets is what's called the dynamo theory. And the dynamo theory says that in order for a planet to generate its own magnetic field, the planet needs to do three things. The planet needs to meet three criteria. The planet needs to be rapidly rotating. It's got to be spinning fast. 
the inside of the planet needs to be able to conduct electricity. Why? Well, remember, remember when we were talking about light and how light is made of electric and magnetic fields? Well, that's because electricity and magnetism go together. Electricity and magnetism are, uh, they're the same phenomenon. Any electric field, any electric field in the universe is created by flowing electricity, by the, by the movement of electric charges. And so if, you're, if a planet is going to make a magnetic field, it needs to be able to carry electric charges. It needs to be able to carry an electric current. And that, that uh, material in the planet, the material inside the planet that is conducting electricity has to be a fluid because that fluid also needs to be hot and convecting. So like I said, there's a lot of moving parts here, right? In order to make a magnetic field, let me let me give you a little cartoon here, right? Um, well, for a terrestrial planet like the Earth, for a terrestrial planet, what, what fluid can convect and conduct electricity? It's the magma, right? Because what is, what is magma made of? It's melted rock and metal, and that, you know, metal can conduct electricity. So in a terrestrial planet, what you're talking about is, is the inside of the planet hot convecting, electrically conducting magma? So what's happening with the Earth? right? The Earth is spinning pretty quickly, right? How long does it take the Earth to spin once? 24 hours, so that's pretty fast. The inside of the planet needs to be hot and molten. It needs to be conducting electricity, in which case it needs to be made of metal, right? And so when you have a planet that is both hot and convecting and spinning and full of electrically conducting fluid, and if it's spinning quickly, then there will be current flowing. Electrical current will be flowing around the inside of the planet. And since that electrical current is flowing inside the planet, it's the electric current that is generating the magnetic field. As long as electric current can keep on flowing inside the planet by the spinning and the convection of the electrically conducting magma, as long as that keeps on going, then that electric flow, that electric current, will keep on creating the Earth's magnetic field. If you are missing any one of those three criteria, though, you don't complete the dynamo, you can't make a magnetic field. So that's what Earth has. Earth is, re Earth is spinning pretty fast. Earth is full of uh, metal, and that can conduct electricity. And that metal, that metallic molten magma, is hot and convecting and flowing. So the Earth has a, has, has a magnetic field. What about the other planets? Do the other planets have uh, strong magnetic fields? Do the other planets meet the, the dynamo theory? We'll see that in just a minute. But before we get there, um, let's get a little bit more practice dealing with these issues uh, on the Earth here. So uh, if you've got a partner, work with your partner. Um, go ahead, open up the green book to page 101 and complete the Earth's changing surface tutorial. Should take you about 15 minutes. So. Go ahead, when I say go, sit down, get this uh, tutorial done, and then we'll pick up the lecture after you're done with that. All right? Give yourself about 15 minutes. Go for it. Okay. Hopefully that made some sense, right? Um, what, you know, there's a lot that we can understand. Uh, the only way to understand why the Earth looks the way that it does uh, is because the Earth is still changing, because the Earth is still hot, convecting inside, and therefore geologically active. How long will that last? If a planet, 
but, but the earth is slowly cooling off right the earth's surface is a warm rock and therefore the earth is you know what does any hot rock do it's going to give off a black body spectrum the earth is slowly cooling off heat is working its way from the core convecting out through the mantle warming up the crust and then the crust of the earth radiates its heat back out into space in the form of its black body spectrum so the earth is slowly losing heat losing energy out to space which means the earth will eventually cool off how long will that take how long does any hot rock take to cool off this is an important question right so this looks there's looks like there's a lot going on in this slide and i let's let's break this down one thing at a time this isn't as scary as it looks right how long does it take for a hot rock to to totally cool off well the time scale right, the time scale to totally cool off depends on how much heat you start out with, how much thermal energy your planet starts out with, divided by how fast you're cooling off, dividing by how much energy you're losing per second. Right? Um, you, if you've got this much heat and you're losing this much heat per second, you divide those two numbers and that'll tell you how many seconds until you lose all the heat. Well, the heat energy the the thermal energy that a planet is born with is is stored throughout the entire volume of the planet so the larger the planet the more volume the planet has the more heat it starts out with so the heat energy that the planet starts out with is proportional to the volume but the planet is cooling itself off through the surface so how fast a planet can cool off is proportional to the surface area now a planet is spherical in shape right so the volume of a sphere depends on the radius cubed but the surface area of a sphere only depends on the radius squared so if you've got the radius cubed divided by the radius squared all you're left with is one power of radius what am i getting at here what i'm saying is the time that it takes for a planet to cool off is proportional to the radius right all of the rocks in our solar system the planets the moons the asteroids they were probably all born eh, about the same temperature they were all born with the same temperature but the bigger the planet the more heat energy it's going to be born with but also if the, if the planet is larger it's got more surface area to cool it itself off through but so when you when you take all of this into effect what that means is the bigger the planet the more time it takes to cool off think about it like this I, I kind of imagine it like this you're making dinner let's say you're making dinner and you're gonna make uh you're gonna cook a potato in the microwave you're, you're gonna cook two potatoes in the microwave i you know it's not baking a or you know microwaving a potato doesn't make it taste as good, but you know, uh, it, it gets it done faster. Uh, <laughs> so let's say in my analogy here, okay, you've got two potatoes, you've got a big russet potato, and you've got a little fingerling potato. You've got this big potato and this small potato, and you put them both in the microwave for five minutes. When you pull those two potatoes out of the microwave, those two potatoes start out at the same temperature, but they're not the same size. Which potato cools off in less time? The small one does, right? The smaller, the smaller potato has a smaller volume to surface area ratio, and therefore the smaller potato takes less time to cool off. So let's say you pull those two potatoes out of the microwave. They're both way too hot to eat. If you wait five minutes, the small potato will have cooled off enough that it's comfortable to eat. The big russet potato will still be scalding hot. You know, you, you got to wait even longer. You got to wait a longer time for that planet to cool. Sorry, for that potato to cool off so that it's edible.
all of the terrestrial planets were born being about the same temperature. But the smaller planets cooled off in less time. The bigger planets are going to take more time to cool off. This is why the small planets like Mercury and Mars, Mercury and Mars are smaller. To go back to the comparison, uh, right? Mercury and Mars are smaller. They used to be hot. Mercury and Mars used to be hot, convecting, volcanic, geologically active. They used to be. But Mercury and Mars are smaller, and they didn't take as long to cool off. And when they cooled off, the magma stopped convecting, the volcanoes went dead, the planet became geologically dead. Earth and Venus are larger. They're still hot and convecting on the inside, and therefore Earth and Venus are still volcanically active. Even after four and a half billion years. Eventually they will cool off. Eventually Earth and Venus will totally cool off and become geologically dead. But because they're larger, it hasn't happened yet. All right? So... What does this look like in, in practice? Well, the moon is even smaller than Mercury. So the moon used to be hot and geologically active, but the moon cooled off in even less time. So when you look at the moon, right? Here's the near side of the moon. When you look at the moon, there are two basic areas of uh, the moon's surface. You've got the light areas and you've got the dark areas. Um, the far side of the moon, the side that you can't see from Earth, but you've got to go out beyond the moon and look back at it to see, um, is almost all the light side. The the light side, the uh, not the light side, the uh, the light areas, the lighter gray areas on the moon are called highlands. They're called highlands because they are higher in elevation, but they're also rough and heavily cratered. Uh, here is what the highlands look like up close. Here's a picture taken from the orbiter uh, on uh, the Apollo 11 mission. Um, heavily cratered, really rough. Where do the craters come from? They come from impacts, right? Rocks smash into the moon and blow out a new crater. And the reason why these highlands on the moon are so heavily cratered is because they're old, right? This area on the moon has been sitting there for a very long time. In this case, three, three and a half billion years old. This area has been sitting there, and therefore, since it's been sitting there unchanged, it's been subject to a lot of impacts. Things have been hitting the this area over and over and over and over and over. And every time an impact happens, you get a new crater. These areas, these highlands, they date back to the period of heavy bombardment. Remember what that is. We, we, we talked about this when we talked about the formation of the solar system. The period of heavy bombardment was that first billion years of the solar system. The first billion years of our solar system was spent with our solar system teeming with leftover planetesimals, leftover chunks of rock and ice crashing into everything, crashing into all the planets, all the moons. You don't find any of these old craters on the Earth. I mean, the Earth must have been hit by a lot of things during the period of heavy bombardment, but none of those craters exist anymore because all of those old craters, all the old surfaces on the Earth, got destroyed by volcanoes or erosion or volcanism, plate tectonics. Didn't happen on the moon. These areas have been sitting there since the period of heavy bombardment, and they've been being pummeled by impacts for billions and billions of years. There's a nice rule of thumb uh, when you're comparing planets in our solar system. And that rule of thumb is the rougher an area is, the older it must be. Right? This area, these highlands on the moon are really rough. They've been hit by impact after impact after impact. 
these areas are saturated in craters. Why are they so rough? Because they're old. They've been, they, they formed early, this area on the moon formed early in the solar system, and it's been sitting there for a long, long time, hit by lots of impacts. And one of the very cool things about craters is that there's a pretty consistent trend in our solar system. And that trend is the bigger the crater, well, the bigger the rock, the bigger the crater. Right? If you've got a big rock smashing into the moon, when that big rock hits the moon, it's going to make a big crater. If you've got a small rock hitting the moon, it's going to make a small crater. Hopefully that's pretty intuitive. Um, but it's not just the moon. It's anywhere in the solar system. There is this trend in our solar system where when an impactor hits a surface, that impact will create a crater 10 times the size of the original impactor. So when when a rock smashes, you know, when a rock crashes into the Earth or the Moon, that rock tends to be going at thousands of miles an hour. It plows into the surface of a planet or the Moon, going thousands of miles an hour. When that impactor smashes into the surface, it shatters, right? The, the original impactor is destroyed, but you blow out that crater, and that crater could last for well, billions of years. Assuming that there's no erosion to destroy the crater, the crater can sit there for billions of years. So you can go back and do the archaeology and say, well, if there's a crater this big, if there's a crater this big on the moon, the rock that made that crater must have been one-tenth that crater's size. Look at this highland on the moon. Are there more big craters or are there more small craters? Well, how many big craters are there? <laughs> Here's the thing you may not have noticed. This is one big crater. You're looking at, you may not have noticed it because you're looking at it almost edge on, but this is one big crater on the horizon of the moon. So there's one giant crater, a handful of medium sized craters, and lots and lots and lots of small craters. Why are there lots of small craters and very few big craters? Well, because there were lots of small rocks and very few big rocks. Remember, that's how our solar system formed, right? Our solar system formed by taking a lot of small objects and having them accrete together to form a smaller number of big objects, and then those big objects accreted together to form an even smaller number of even bigger objects that eventually became planets and moons. And then even after that, even after our solar system had formed, what do we find today in our solar system? Four and a half billion years later, we find our solar system is full of lots of small objects, like comets and asteroids, and a, a smaller number of big objects, like planets. This trend, this big piece of evidence that tells us that the nebular theory is right, this has been true for the whole history of the solar system. It was true at the beginning, and it's true today. And it's been true throughout the whole history of the solar system. And it's true on Earth, too. right? This trend, this ratio that, that the crater is 10 times the size of the impactor, uh, it's true on the moon, it's true on Mars, it's true on the Earth. So you can look at a crater on the Earth, and you can go back and do the you know, work backwards and do the archaeology and say, how big must this rock have been? So, for instance, the, the Behringer Meteor Crater up in northern Arizona, that crater is about a kilometer across, Oops. right? That crater is about a kilometer in diameter. So how big was the rock that made that crater? How, how big was the rock that made the Be Behringer Crater? That rock must have been a tenth of a kilometer, right? You don't need a rock this big to make a crater this big. You need a rock one-tenth that size. So back when that crater was made that rock must have been that impactor must have been a tenth of a kilometer until it smashed into arizona and blew out a crater that was one kilometer across so if if the most common objects in our solar system are the smallest ones what that means is that our solar system is teeming with 
countless tiny little rocks just zipping around the solar system. And it's true. That is exactly what's happening. Um, our solar system is swarming with lots and lots and lots of little micrometeorites. And when a little micrometeorite falls toward the Earth, it burns up in the atmosphere and you see a little meteor. Why do those meteors burn up in the atmosphere? Well, friction, right? They're, they're plowing, they're falling toward the Earth at thousands of miles an hour. They're plowing through the atmosphere. The atmospheric friction heats them up and the rocks disintegrate. They, they never reach the ground. The micrometeorites never reach the ground here on Earth. But the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. And so when those micrometeorites, when these tiny little rocks are falling toward the moon, they're basically little bullets. They are little rocks plowing toward the moon at thousands of miles an hour. And when they hit the surface, they just break up the rock. The surface of the moon has been steadily mulched up and pulverized by lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little micrometeorite strikes, hammering the moon, pulverizing the rock over billions and billions of years until the whole surface of the moon today is covered in this layer of rock dust. The name for this stuff is called regolith. Right? The, re the, the, the moon is covered in this regolith of pulverized rock dust. This is a form of erosion. Right? When you look at the moon, the moon is, is all of these hills and rocks have been smoothed over because all the rough edges have been worn away by little chips, little bullets, little micrometeorite strikes over and over and over again over billions of years. Until the whole surface of the moon is covered in this, in this layer of soft powdery regolith. This is how you can leave a nice little boot print. Um, you know, the, the Apollo astronauts could leave a, a nice clean boot print because the whole surface of the moon is covered in this regolith has like the consistency of flour. Um, it's easy to compress as you walk around through it. This is the only form of erosion on the moon because there's no wind to cause wind erosion on the moon. There's no liquid water to cause water erosion. The features on the moon last for a very long time, billions of years, but they are slowly, slowly, slowly being eroded away by uh, impacts, turning the moon into this soft powder. The dark areas on the moon are called Maria and the Maria are, uh, well, the, the word Maria comes from the Latin word for seas. So when, you know, people have known, okay, there's light areas and dark areas on the moon for all of human history. It's easy to see, right? But when you look at the moon with telescopes, the, uh, oh, let me get a close up here. Okay. So here's what the Maria look like close up. When you look at this through a telescope, like let's say in the 1600s, right? When the, when the very first astronomers used telescopes, people like Galileo looked at the moon, you look at those dark areas and it looks smooth. It looks placid and it looks lower in elevation. The Maria are lower in elevation. They're, they're underneath, well, I shouldn't say that, but they are, they're depressed. They are lower in elevation than the highlands are and they are dark. They are smooth, they are placid, um, like the surface of the ocean. And so that's why they called them mare, right? Mare is the Latin word for sea. So Maria is plural, no, seas or oceans. Um, the Maria are giant impact craters. The, the biggest impact craters are called impact basins. And basically, look at the shape of the Maria. The Maria are round, like an impact crater, because they formed from impact craters. Because remember, when the moon was young, the moon was still hot and molten and volcanic. 
So here's how you form the Maria, right? You the the moon forms, you know, four and a half billion years ago, the moon forms a rocky crust, and then during the period of heavy bombardment, it gets hit by some giant impact. Each of these each of these mare used to be a huge crater. Right? Imagine a crater that size on the moon. It would be huge. What kind of impact or what kind of rock makes a crater that big? A big damn rock. So some giant rock smashes into the moon, blows out this giant crater, and also cracks the crust. So that the crust underneath this crater is now shattered, and then out of those cracks, lava can flow. Because back then, the moon was still hot and molten and convecting. And, there, and the, moon, the, the, the inside of the moon was full of magma, and that convecting magma bubbled its way up. It found a crack. It flowed out of the cracks, and volcanoes erupted. Lava poured across the surface of the moon. Once upon a time, each of these mare was a lake of lava. And then, eventually, the lava cooled off, and it hardened, and it became new, smooth crust. That's why the Maria are lower in elevation, because they used to be, they, 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 the mare formed from a filling in a crater. But that's also why the Maria are so smooth, because they're, they're newer. Right? How do you form a new smooth surface on a planet? You got to do it from lava. You got to do it from active geology, pouring lava across the surface, and then that lava cools off and hardens and lays down a new smooth layer of rock. There's that rule of thumb I said a minute ago, right? The rule of thumb on any terrestrial body is rough means old, smooth means young. Right? These Maria still have some craters, right? There are still some craters because even after the Mare formed, some impacts happened after that. But this is considerably smoother because these Mare formed much more recently. And then you can still see one of the very cool things um, that that one of the very cool things that was discovered by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter when the when the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter went into orbit around the Moon uh, several years ago now um, is that they could take these really high resolution detailed maps of the Moon and you can look down into these mare and what do you find you find these little well they look like riverbeds uh, they're called rills and these are basically little valleys little channels carved out from flowing lava and there are still some some dormant volcanoes like right there still some dormant volcanoes that used to be erupting poured out the lava that filled in the mare and then when the moon cooled off the volcanoes went dead and all the lava cooled off the moon is geologically dead the moon has completely cooled off the moon is just one big hard cool rock today because it's been billions and billions of years but once upon a time the moon used to be hot and molten and convecting and volcanic you can see the leftover dead volcanoes and the and the lava flows right there still alive today or not alive but still extant still surviving today uh, for us to take pictures of One of the other big, very cool discoveries uh, of the moon um, from, in the, from the last few years is water. Um, they, people had been suspecting for quite a while, right? What would it take for water to exist on uh, the moon? Well, you can't have water where the moon is hot. Well, where is the moon hot? Anywhere that it gets sunlight right? The moon has no atmosphere, and therefore there's no atmospheric pressure. You need atmospheric pressure to have liquid water. So the moon can't have liquid water because there's no atmosphere. The only way for water to exist is as ice. 
because the moon doesn't have enough gravity to hold on to water vapor. If you just let some water go on the moon, that water would instantly get baked by the sunlight, it would, ev it would evaporate, and then it would float around, you know, water vapor would float around the moon for a little bit, but eventually it would reach the escape speed, it would just blow out and escape the moon entirely. The only way to have water on the moon and have it stay there is if it's frozen as ice. The problem is, where could you possibly find a place on the moon where that ice wouldn't get baked by sunlight? And the answer was near the poles. Because near the poles, and this is a picture of the south pole of the moon. Near the south pole, there are all of these craters. And because this is the south pole, the sunlight is shining on the, the south pole at a very shallow angle. Since the sunlight is shining at a shallow angle, the bottoms of these craters are always in shadow. The bottoms of these craters never get direct sunlight. Never. And sunlight is the only heat source left on the moon, which means the daytime on the moon gets very hot. But the bottoms of these craters are insanely cold because it's always dark and it's always in shadow down there. And people sort of did the math and said, well, if there's, it, if there's water, it would stay frozen, right? The sunlight, if there's water frozen in those craters, that water would always be frozen because it would never get hit by sunlight to evaporate it and have the water vapor escape out into space. There could be, we think, there could be water down there. Well, how do we go and find out? You can't just look, you can't just point a telescope at the crater because it's dark down there because it never gets sunlight. So what they did is they were launching this LCROSS satellite. Um, they were launching the LCROSS satellite to go into orbit around the moon. And since they launched the satellite, they were like, hey, well, we got this leftover rocket engine, right? Because once you've used up a rocket, it's just a, a useless hunk of metal after that. Most of the time when you use up a rocket engine, you just let it crash back down into, you know, the Atlantic Ocean or somewhere. Uh, and then, you know, uh, pirates go and salvage the metal. Um, I mean, I guess it's not piracy if it crashes in international waters. I'm not, I'm not a, an expert on maritime salvage law. Um, but instead of doing that, um, instead of doing that, they decided to actually use the rocket engine as an impactor. So while they sent this satellite to go into orbit around the moon, they took this used up hunk of metal rocket engine and they just pointed it at this crater right there on the moon. And they told astronomers all over the world, okay, we're going to be crashing this hunk of steel into that crater on the moon at this day and time. They told everybody because you only have one shot at this. And so there were telescopes all over the world pointing at the moon to see what comes out. Uh, and at the, at the appointed time, they smash that used up rocket into the moon and a cloud of debris gets kicked up out of the, out of the crater. And when that cloud of debris got shot out of the crater, it got hit by sunlight and you could see it. And what was the what was the what was the debris from that crater made of? Well, a lot of rock and lunar regolith, but also water. There were signs of water frozen at the bottom of that crater. Like a hundred liters. Like this one this one little cloud had a hundred liters of water from that one impact. This was a huge confirmation to say, wow, I mean, most of the moon is bone dry. Most of the moon has been baked by direct sunlight for billions and billions of years. It's bone dry. But even on the bone dry moon, there are some places where it's dark enough all the time that the, that the water could stay frozen. Which is super handy because when we eventually start building cities on the moon, we're going to need to bring water with us. And it would be really nice if we didn't have to truck up all that water from Earth with us. It'd be nice if we could just mine the ice that's already there on the moon. Um, but that's a little bit science fictional at this point. Um, 
the 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 interesting science here is to say we've been spending decades we've been spending decades um looking around our solar system and saying where is the water because water means life right and if water is unique to earth then maybe life is unique to earth and that makes the prospects of finding life somewhere in the universe not look so good but the fact that you find a lot of water on the moon even though most of the moon is bone dry the fact that you find some water on the moon um means well heck if water can get to the earth and water can get to the moon maybe the odds of finding water elsewhere in the solar system uh don't look so bad so let's keep on looking if there's some on the moon where else could there be some okay um it's been oh it's been about an hour um i want to give you a, a quick overview of what the geology on mercury venus and mars are like but um you know what i'm going to take a break here so you take a break too um i will split this into two videos so we will uh we will continue looking at the other terrestrial planets um, in the next video. All right. So uh, hope you're doing well. Have a good one. Uh, take a break, stretch your legs, and uh, then continue with the next video.